Brian Mullen, congratulations. Thank you. You, you must be incredibly excited. Oh, I am. I am. Uh, because anyone who's just watching this uh, video uh, is about to learn that you have been chosen by Theatre 503 as part of their mentoring um, writers in residence, mm -hmm. which you've been doing for how long? For 18 months. Mm -hmm. So it's a program called the 5035. Um, so uh, it would have been just the end of 2014, I guess, that it was announced. And from 2015 onward, uh, Five of us were in residence receiving mentorship and the commission of a new play. And we, yours has been chosen? It has been, yeah. It's the, the first one that's been chosen to be uh, put on in five or three seasons. How season. did that feel? Uh, it felt very exciting. Um, you know, I think 503 is such a valuable and important kind of institution because yes. they really go um, to the plate, as we Americans would say, <laughs> <laughs> for um, for new writers in yes. the sense that they um, they only put on new plays and despite operating on a, f on a fringe budget they put on amazing productions that kind of feel really professional mm -hmm. and so when I uh, was selected for the five uh, that alone was was thrilling and exciting <laughs> and to feel that I was working on this play with a lot of support from the theatre and the dramaturgical team as it went through its many, many drafts until we've arrived now in rehearsal and uh, opening in a few weeks. <laughs> you, downstairs they're actually rehearsing as we they speak. Are, yeah. Um, and how's it going? It's going really well. Mm. Um, we have an extraordinary cast. Um, a great cast. Yeah, they're great. Um, one of the things when I when I was sort of trying to decide what kind of play I wanted to write um, and knowing that I was going to have this space and support to kind of develop something I might not otherwise if I was just working on my own. I knew I wanted to write um, a story about kinds of characters that don't often get represented on stage that I've seen and I particularly wanted to um, write some female characters, some strong... Very, very topical, Brian. Yeah, well I wanted to write some strong and complicated female characters who were not anybody's wife or grandmother or mm. mother or anything and um, that meant and for reasons that I could talk about that I ended up wanting to write a story about uh, a couple of Catholic nuns really crusading maverick Catholic nuns so it sort of takes us back to your youth because <laughs> you were brought up by a nun an well, in, in, in a way my yeah. um, my family is Catholic and on, on both sides, my mother and father, there's, there's different people who were ordained religious. Uh -huh. But my, my dad's sister, my Aunt Jerry, was a Franciscan nun in the 1960s and 70s. And I think from, from the stories she's told me and, and the other women uh, from her generation that I've spoken to, that was a really transformative time for religious orders um, around the world, but especially in the United States, because the 60s were a time when the church, uh, um, you might have heard of Vatican II, the yes. kind of Second Vatican Council. I was raised as a Catholic Okay, okay. So and the, all about the Vatican II. The, the reforms that were kind of meant to open up the doors of the church and the windows to the modern world. And in a lot of orders, young sisters, because there were lots more priests and nuns in those days, a lot more people joining yes, the orders, there were record numbers, but the younger people were saying, how can we connect more with the mission of what we're meant to be doing instead of staying cloistered away from the world? Mm -hmm. So my aunt, with a number of other young sisters, have been working in a Catholic hospital, but they said, you know what, there's, there's homeless women um, all over the streets of New York City, and to help them, we need to, to leave the kind of seclusion of the convent and take over a tenement building and create a dwelling place where we, the sisters, will live with homeless women. And it was actually um, the first shelter for women in all of New York City, it was wow. only for men, the rest of the shelter system. Mm -hmm. So my aunt was a very inspiring person just in, in the sense of how much she devoted to the idea of helping others and changing the world. So this is the setting? Well, in a way. So yeah. the, my play, We Wait in Joyful Hope, is without a doubt not a representation of my actual aunt. Um, <laughs> if we should, I don't want to give that impression. No. Sister Bernie, the main character of my play, um, has done something similar mm -hmm. with, um, with s some other sisters around the same time. But she is a tough-talking, 
uh, salty mouthed pot smoking nun <laughs> who is completely comfortable, you know, dealing with um, vulnerable women, prostitutes, as well as police officers, gang leaders, kind of anyone she comes up against. She's a, she's a force to be reckoned with. She's a force of nature. And my aunt is a very different kind of a person. So I, <laughs> I don't want to give to that, that you see her <laughs> in that life. <laughs> well, no, but I don't because I actually... Um, uh, There's she, probably more similarities than, than on the paper. What I was going to say was, yeah. we, you're describing a real toughie to me. Yeah. And uh, having been around a number of nuns yeah. in my early life, yeah. I get the impression that they are pretty tough cookies. They often have to work in a man's world. They do. And and deal with some pretty tough subjects. And we don't necessarily focus on them, do no. we? No. I mean, I think, you know, I've raised a lot of eyebrows when I was working on this play and people said to me, um, what are you writing about? So I'm writing a play about nuns. I'm like, oh, what is it? Sister Act 3? Or, you know, <laughs> and I think that we have this stereotypical vision from Sister Act, The Sound of Music, of what nuns are like. But if you've ever grown up with or known modern nuns, they do incredible work. Mm. And often, as you point out, I mean, the church and on all society is very male dominated, mm. but nuns are women who have given up the notion of family and marriage because they believe in, 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 being of incredible service yeah. and so it wasn't just my aunt that I kind of talked with when I was thinking about writing the story I she very um, kindly put me in touch with some of her former colleagues Franciscan sisters who are now in their 70s and 80s and I spoke to also some um, Anglican nuns here in the UK and just kind of got a sense of what was it that drew them to this life and and even more what has sustained them yeah. over all these many decades when they're often not recognized yeah. for the kind of work they're doing and, that and to get something done they often have to you know work it don't they they yeah. really do yeah um tell me what's it like to be in rehearsal uh -huh. and to be weeks away from the opening of your first play well <laughs> i mean it's my yeah my first full production of a play and uh it's i mean it's, it's thrilling because we have as i said cast I think the play extremely well. That's mm -hmm. up to um, our director, Lisa Kanyachi, who did a brilliant job. Um, and particularly, I think we've got people who have a deep understanding of the history and complications of these characters. So, so Maggie McCarthy and Deirdre Morris, who are taking the lead roles, even over a week and a half where we've been working, it's been fascinating to have conversations about the backstories of mm -hmm. these women and to watch Deirdre and Maggie in their own histories um, of having been raised Catholic and, you know, their, their, their long careers and their, their life experience kind of blend right. with the characters and watch them form a bond. Um, and I think uh, the other cast members are extraordinary as well. And um, there's nothing like having pictured in your mind's eye a set of people on the page and, and then, then thinking, it come to yeah, thinking these are exactly the right people to be doing it. Yeah. So, I, I and also, do I imagine it. there's sometimes when you actually have, have lived with some lines that perhaps you've changed and reworked and changed again, and then you hear them said and you think, that's not, a, actually, that's better than I thought. Well, yeah, of course, that's, <laughs> the, that's the standard thing of any, of any writer. I mean, you, it's not a novel, right? No. It's not something that's meant to be read. It's something that's meant to be to be brought to life, mm. and they really are embodying it, I think, with humor and emotion and pathos. It must be so wonderful to see that. Yeah. What is the first thing uh -huh. that you actually write when you... What, what's on that first page? Now, I know that it's not a pad and a pencil that you It is, at, actually, yeah. It is. You, 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 yeah. Do, you do longhand. I, I do. So I mean, what's I have on a... that first page? Is it like a breakdown, or is it, is it the first scene, or is it... Well, the... you've got to have an impulse for a play, and I think that the impulse has to probably come from a character or a situation and it has to have some kind of tension or unanswered question within it. Mm. Um, so for me, for this play, well, I knew the sort of general type of character and world I wanted to write, but I, I wanted to write about, a, about yeah. Sister Bernie, who's the nun at the, in the center of the play, at a moment when she's facing a challenge wow. and a change. Mm. The world around her is changing mm. and also she's facing sort of the end of her life. And I didn't know how it was all going to work out. But um, I do, yeah, write longhand with a pen. Um, I find that my mind can be freer in a notebook if I kind of write without stopping and sort of get... So I'll say, okay, well, we'll start the play here <laughs> with this scene, and I'll just run with it and go. And it has to be early in the morning as well. I, when I'm working on the first draft of a play, I'll often get up, you know, five or six in the morning not talk to anyone and just not eat any breakfast and just write and then a lot of that won't end up in the in the finished play 
but there'll be a kernel of something, of some kind of discovery when my brain is not censoring mm -hmm. you know, my ideas, mm -hmm. that then becomes the kind of working ideas that you, that you carry forward. And eventually, of course, you're going to type it into the laptop. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it without, without pen and paper. I have many, many notebooks at home that are, that are full of old drafts. Well, we'll, be, we'll be watching with interest the opening, and we're going to come along with... Um, yeah, we can't wait to see it, because it sounds fantastic. I mean, Great. it sounds very topical. Yeah. But um, I'm just wondering, in conclusion, what would you say to young writers? I mean, you were given the opportunity through Theatre 503. Yeah. But it's a, that's a really hard, hard uh, career choice, isn't it, really? It is. I mean, I think the thing to understand is that, uh, you know, and I'm, I don't even, at this point, I don't consider myself a young writer. I consider myself someone who has been developing in, and have had productions and workshops and been working as a dramaturg in lots of different ways. But yes. as I said, this is my first professional production. And mm. I think the myth that so often gets um, spread out in the media of the overnight success, you know, the Look, person a, who's... A story within us. Yeah, well, has or they've written their first play and suddenly it's picked from a contest or it's been sent in, is almost never true. Oh. I mean, I, while I was writing this play, I um, was reading John Lahr's wonderful biography of Tennessee Williams. I, I think it seeped a lot into this play. Mm. Um, and, you know, I mean, Tennessee Williams wrote several plays <laughs> all through his 20s and 30s that no one wanted, wanted to, to do know about. Until, he, until he hit on The Glass Menagerie. And mm. that was in a time when I think it was even easier for writers. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think the thing is to just... If it's something that you're passionate about, you have to find the time and space to be able to work on your craft and and seek out networking and people who can offer you support. And they have to be the right kind of people. They have to be people who get what your work is. Mm. Um, and, you know, just put yourself in the right kinds of places. Find the time and space, whatever other jobs you're doing, mm. um, to put in the effort of, of writing the best script that you can. We look forward to seeing you opening night Thanks very much. Broadway. Oh, well, yeah, we'll see about that, yeah. <laughs>